Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Emmy O'Brien, and I'm very excited about the event here tonight. It's been organized, hosted by Haymarket, and uh, supported by them, uh, and organized and hosted by PINCO, PINCO Magazine. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about PINCO and some of our thinking for the event, and then I'll read the bios for our great speakers tonight, and then ask a series of questions of each speaker, and then sort of we will open it up and have a more open conversation in the panel. Um, and uh, at some point, people can put in your own questions on YouTube, and uh, we will try to integrate those uh, as the program goes on. Uh, so PINCO is a collective for thinking gay communism together. We publish two print issues so far, periodic zines, and host irregular essays, translations, and archival material on our website, PINCO.online. This is the second in an event series we're doing this fall, specifically on the current political attacks on queer and trans people. Uh, for most of the left, political violence is a forbidden topic. But at this moment, queer and trans people face the real threat of violence from a growing movement of armed fascists in America. How can we think about this and what steps are necessary to defeat them? What do existing projects do to keep us safe and what do they have to teach us? So that's our formulation of the event. Uh, the other members editorial team at PINCO were all played very instrumental and active roles in conceptualizing and organizing this event. Um, I'll add a little bit about uh, my own thinking in doing this to help get us started. Often the really valuable skills, experience, and organization around militant self-defense is pretty isolated to a relatively small group of revolutionaries in specific segments of working class life. I grew up in the 90s in Oregon when the neo-Nazi movement was very large, and there was a vibrant, sharp skinhead scene that engaged in violent confrontations with Nazis. And there was always a political dynamic with whether they were completely isolated from the less, uh, the segments of the anti-fascist movement that would not engage in self-defense in any meaningful way. Um, and uh, so at, at different historical moments, broader self-defense was taken up by a broader segment of the working class as part of integrated mass movements. And we know some of the history of the Black Panthers and other periods in history when this has happened. Um, in uh, our planning for this event and talking about it, Melissa Jura Grant, one of our panelists, told a story uh, sort of describing a shift uh, on the ground of liberal activists, pro-gay activists, or people who previously might really distance themselves from militants or revolutionaries or self-defense or riots or whatnot, suddenly finding themselves relying on anti-fascists, experienced anti-fascist activists, to be able to attend an event or walk to their car when events were being targeted by, by fascists uh, uh, around attacking queerness and trans life. And so that dynamic of sort of this moment of self-defense being looked at, being considered, being taken seriously more broadly is one of the reasons that I was really excited about doing this event and trying to think about if we're in a moment right now that self-defense could become salient for a much broader range of people. And if the skills of people on this panel and people that we're in touch with might be useful in trying to think about that. Okay, now I'll read the bios and I'll read them in the order of the, who I'm going to ask questions of. Uh, so Melissa Jira Grant is a staff writer at the New Republic, the author of Playing the Whore, the Work of Sex Work, published by Verso, and an excellent book, I'll add, and the co-director of They Won't Call It Murder, executive produced by Field of Vision. She has reported on violence against Resistance to police killings in Columbus and the global movement for sex worker rights. She's currently at work on a new book, A Woman is Against the Law, Sex, Race, and the Limits of Justice in America, to be published by Little Brown and Company. LV is a communist living in Los Angeles. She organized the Bash Back Denver and the 2010 Bash Back Convergence 
as well as a number of militant queer groups in Los Angeles, such as Trans Liberation LA, Trans Undocumented Rapid Response Network, or CHURN, and the 2014 Queer Apocalypse. She is a practicing conflict mediator and developing an eco-defense video game. Sheila T is a huge nerd and trans feminine person and anarchist living in Philadelphia. She's been practicing an anarchist and queer struggles since around 2010. Max, they them, is a community organizer in Sacramento, California. Their work usually revolves around the abolition of prisons and private property, but they have been an active organizer against platforms of far-right extremism and Christo-fascism uh, for many years. Um, so we're very excited to have these panelists, and thank you all for being here tonight. So I wanted to open with a sort of broad overview and asking Melissa, could you give us an overall picture of nationally of the fa fascist upsurge and the attacks on anti-queer and anti-trans people? Sure, thank you so much also to Pinko and to Haymarket for doing this. These are the questions that have been on my mind all summer, all year. Um, so this couldn't be better timed. I feel like I've spent the last year doing nothing but following these attacks. And there's way more than I could possibly summarize in the time that we have here. So I thought what I would do is sort of talk about the pattern and then talk about a couple of specific attacks that I think illustrate this pattern. So the pattern as I've seen it sort of honed over the last two years. We have individuals mobilizing across the US, often unaffiliated with any well-known far-right group, influenced by propaganda that's being shared by popular social media accounts. So this is not happening on like the fringes of the internet. That propaganda demonizes LGBTQ people as dangerous to children. And then these individuals terrorize libraries, schools, hospitals, churches, other community spaces that are welcoming to queer and trans people. And then they document the ensuing pushback and conflict as evidence that they themselves are victims under attack by some powerful lobby, which is a very classic fascist move to position yourself as the victim in the violence that you've instigated and to, to over-exaggerate the power of the people that you're actually doing violence against. So I'm going to focus on how we're seeing these forms of mutually reinforcing violence where we see these fascist formations that are mostly in particular cities or sometimes networked across the country and how that's connected with elected officials who are working at the local state and federal level and how those different groups are reinforcing these messages and driving this violence um, in tandem. So here's two examples of what look like they could be disparate attacks that happened over the course of three months, but I think they show how all these attacks are linked, who coordinates them, and then who the boots on the ground are, as it were. So I'm going to start in Dallas uh, this June. There's a group there called Protect Texas Kids. It's a pretty new group, and it's headed by a self-described Christian fascist whose name is Kelly Niedert. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly. I have not met her. Um, she organized a protest of a family-friendly drag show, along with other individuals and white nationalist groups who showed up as well. And what they did is they surrounded the club holding the event, Mr. Mister, which was in like a like gay neighborhood in the suburb of Dallas. They chanted groomer at the families and kids who were lining up on the sidewalk to get into the event. They got up in their faces. One of them was waving a Christo-fascist or Christian nationalist flag. And the children are standing a line there, you know, plugging their ears with their fingers as white nationalists are yelling at them and their parents about child rape through a megaphone. And what's one guy who was captured on a video said, the fist of Christ will come down on you very soon while screaming again at this scene of, of kids and their parents. So for hours, this went on. Um, some of them were reciting sidewalk prayers, sort of reminiscent of anti-abortion groups outside clinics. Some of them directly threatened people, followed them to their cars, and then recorded themselves in these confrontations that they instigated. And then a little more than 48 hours later, Tucker Carlson was airing heavily edited versions of these videos in a segment that he introduced with just another weekend in Weimar. And Texas Republican lawmakers shortly after pledged to introduce legislation to ban drag shows in the presence of minors with Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, the federal representatives voicing their support. 
So Protect Texas Kids announced this rally by sharing a post uh, about the event from the Libs of TikTok Twitter account. It has 1.4 million followers. They often share, you know, flyers for drag events. They share videos from TikTok and other places of queer and trans folks. They really like honing in on librarians, educators, like anybody that they think is like an influence, a bad influence on children, essentially. Um, and they're a really powerful sort of mobilizer because they have this huge audience. Um, so they share this flyer. Protect Texas Kids share the flyer, had the date, location. And there was in part of this mega drag thread, there's lots of, you know, these events that Libs of TikTok is like regularly pushing out to their audience. One of the other things Libs of TikTok has been doing is targeting hospitals that provide gender affirming care to young people. Um, after this campaign, multiple bomb threats were made to the Boston Children's Hospital at the end of the summer. And Libs of TikTok also amplified threats that were made in September by the Daily Wire blogger and podcaster Matt Walsh. He claimed he was investigating a pediatric gender affirming care clinic at the Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. And in another tactic reminiscent of anti-abortion groups, Walsh just singled out the doctors by name. And almost immediately, Tennessee Republican Governor Bill Lee joined Walsh's call for an investigation into the hospital, followed closely by Tennessee Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn, and said, let's hope they act immediately to stop this crime. And the hospital, after being harassed and threatened after this, removed the clinic's page from their website. So a couple days after this, Protect Texas Kids is back. Um, they don't go all the way to Tennessee. They found another drag event at a church in Texas, which is like a queer affirming church that had this like drag closet for kids. And, you know, it was a place where they could get clothes that suited them, particularly if like their families like weren't supporting them. The church was a supportive place for them. Um, and they were doing a drag bingo fundraiser for this like trans kids program. Um, this little church in Katy, Texas, Steve Bannon talks about it on his program. He promotes this protest who calls it, has a guest on who calls the protest a spiritual battle and that the goal of it was to stop parents from supporting their trans kids. And at this one, we saw we saw a neo-Nazi group called the Aryan Freedom Network and also Proud Boys were present and some protesters carried swastika flags along with anti-Semitic and homophobic signs. So just in a couple of weeks from Walsh starting his campaign, we see numerous threats and calls for violence that have been directed at hospitals across the country. And that children's hospital he targeted announced it was going to stop providing gender affirming surgeries to those under 18. And he wasn't done. He capped this off with a sort of a victory lap. He held a rally to end child mutilation in Nashville uh, a week or so ago, along with Blackburn and also Tulsi Gabbard um, and Proud Boys who showed up once the rally was already underway and what people there said kind of looked like this like planned militaristic entrance, like a show of force um, with the state troopers, you know, just kind of standing between them and all the people who showed up to support trans kids and mostly drowned out the speakers. Um, but then it got kind of pitched as like two sides in a fight when, you know, what was going on was an attempt to sort of defend the community from all of these people. And of course, after the rally, you know, none of the elected officials there present um, said anything to condemn the Proud Boys presence. So that's just a, a kind of a snapshot of what this cycle is, of how things are moving from these confrontations in particular places documented. They get onto Fox News that generates more social media content, which generates more protests. And it's just been spinning like this for months. Um, and of course, it goes back further, but I will wait until we get into that later. Uh, frame of what is new in this conjuncture, right? So attacks on queer and trans people have been happening for a long time. There have been fascists in America a long time. Is there something about this moment that you feel like has some novelty or some change? I'll pop in there. Yeah, um, please, Max. You know, I was actually jotting down some notes on like what's new. Um, 
in this moment, you know, and that's everything from like the technology that we use to share the information and the ways in which they create silos for themselves. Like that's what the right and, um, and folks have been getting good at for the last several decades is how to create these silos of information where they can all gather and, um, and brainwash each other um, and not allow in any qualitative new information to allow for their growth and learning. Um, but I, what I really think is actually the, the most profound part about what's happening in our current political climate is the desperation of the elite. Um, do you see the devastation that we see around us is due to like capitalism ending and they absolutely need a section of the working class to usher in the new but kind of old form of what we're calling like neo-feudalism as our next economic system. You know, the truth is, and we talk on this, right? The truth is like that the rise of fascism for thousands of years has began with attacks on queer people, trans people, women, POC. And, it, you know, it's what Hitler did in, with the, and the Nazis did in Berlin. It's what the Industrial South did um, before that and so on. And, and where we're starting to see these big changes um, is in the fact that like there is so much devastation happening around us and all of us are trying to make sense of that devastation whether no matter what side of this this thing we're on um, and and that right there is like what's causing us to now be willing to no longer uh, 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 engage in discourse in the streets you know about it that like this is a, a moment of survival for many people um, and and it and it is giving and it, and they're using this disaster as a way to like mobilize their base, this fascist base for their fascist thinking, um, to be able to like I said usher in this new economic system. Sheila T, is there anything you'd like to add before I ask LV a question? Um, not super specifically. I was also going to point out maybe the like technological changes and how those have kind of just like facilitated and helped like further decentralize and like aid a lot of people to kind of like, yeah, like mutually brainwash each other and feel empowered to kind of like act across like much bigger geographical areas. But I feel like most of that was touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, LV, uh, you're welcome to add to this, but I wanted to ask the next question, sort of going back in history a little bit, sort of thinking about uh, immediate antecedents or uh, preceding events to the current conjuncture. Um, could you share about the history of Bash Back? And um, for audience members who might know nothing about the organization, the network and its history. Sure, um, yeah, Bash Back was kind of uh, made a big splash, but was very short lived um, from like 2008 to 2011. It got its start in, um, you know, conflict or street clashes with Nazis in particular in Milwaukee and in other cities in the Midwest. And it's sort of, um, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in the last year um, in particular is, you know, what, what made Bashback kind of happen in that moment and not in this moment, it, you know, the network of Bashback, because it was sort of like, um, felt like there was, thousands of you know militant queers that were supporting each other and um publicizing their actions and doing you know kind of like hyping each other up to fight back against you know homophobia transphobia racism like a, a number sexual violence like a number of different things and i think um yeah i just feel like one of the one of the aspects that um made bashback somewhat yeah, just made it different was um, just the coming together of people. I think that uh, in 2008, when, um, you know, the broadcasting and the, the kind of like social dimension of these actions um, made this sort of like the experience around um, queer self-defense and queer violence, like more, um, more powerful, I would say. And so like in 2008, when, um, the, there was this clash in Milwaukee. It was sort of like a, they circulated a picture of themselves like wearing um, these pink masks and holding bats and wrote like a little communique and posted it on um, anarchistnews.org, which just seemed to be like a big deal at that time. I felt like 
in the late 2000s, it felt very much like the revolutionary left was kind of dominated by like anarchist discourse. Um, and so, you know, that kind of like created a container for that discussion and people were able to kind of discuss in these comment forums, um, I guess sort of like, you know, in a Reddit like vibe, all of these different kind of actions and sort of like organize themselves to form chapters in other cities and, and in different capacities. And so from that kind of like experience, people called for a convergence um, in you know, Minneapolis. And then there was another convergence, which was very large in Chicago. Um, and then the final one was in, it, it was in Denver. And um, I think that the convergence model is another aspect of Bashback that I kind of feel like I, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. I feel like on the one hand, it, it enabled the conditions to bring people together in this kind of like, you know, very visible way. And on the other hand, it was, um, I think like most people probably in this panel and maybe like the listeners will probably agree that it's sort of like when you bring together a lot of like radicals or just anybody, um, you know, conflict is going to arise and it's sort of like bashback is ironically like formed around conflict around like head, like facing conflict head on, but it's sort of like the interpersonal conflict is what seems to tank these projects like consistently. And I feel like that was the case with Bashback. It's sort of like in Denver, we had, um, you know, we'd made, we, we made a lot of like efforts to do conflict mediation within the different people that were coming to the convergence. However, it's sort of like some of these like splits just became unmanageable. And, um, and I think there was also kind of like an ideological split there too, where it was sort of like, um, there were more community, there's kind of like a community building aspect of like self-defense and saying like, okay, we're, we're going to mostly focus on like legible targets and, um, you know, neo-Nazis and, and different kind of like very like visible moments. And then there's sort of more like what I would consider like kind of an anarcho insurrectionist approach, which is more like we're going to attack in the multiplicity of ways that this violence is, is enact this oppression is enacting on us. So it's more kind of like, how do we, how do we confront bigots on the street? And it's, it's not, it's very difficult to like organize a group of people around that. Whereas like, kind of anarcho-insurrectionist response is more like, okay, well, we're fighting all the time and this fight never ends. And it's sort of like a pure, we're kind of like embracing this like pure negation. And so bashback kind of was the synthesis of these two different like approaches. And I think that for like a brief moment, it was like a really beautiful synthesis and could have been a very powerful one. But I think ultimately like there wasn't, it, they're, they're somewhat incompatible, but like I don't think that we were able to kind of hold those two together and move forward with them, um, which is probably what it would have taken for that to last. So I guess I feel like, um, you know, I, I feel like there, I absolutely feel like there needs to be something like bashback right now. I think like, especially for um, supporting youth that are engaging in defense right now, like, um, in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, we had, you know, a, a number of street, like street clashes with Nazis um, around the We Spa stuff. And um, so people are, are doing this self-defense action, but it's, it's the more social aspect of it that isn't, that seems to be like missing from that component, sort of like the isolated actions are happening, but like the communication, and the, the almost like celebration and the hyping up of each other around those actions is not really like, I think we need to strategize to how to create that a, a new container that makes sense for, for this moment. One, one aspect that you spoke about, but I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more is the, the way Bashback uh, networked people across the country and also had some international connections and the sort of a little bit about the scope and the kind of networked quality of it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of that was 
the, you know, um, the fact that, you know, Aragorn had created this platform with anarchistnews.org um, and kind of like just contain that dialogue. And um, so it's essentially like somebody that was sympathetic to the bashback cause was like, like allow, uh, like creating a space for this conversation to happen. Whereas like, you know, the dialogues that are happening around self-defense right now, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's on like TikTok or a number of different platforms are just these kind of like sites of corporate alienation that like no organize, no actual like in-person organizing can come out of those kind of experiences. So, you know, I personally think that the, the social, like being in proximity to each other is really important. So um, yeah, these, these convergences were important. And I think it was like at that point in like the late 2000s, it was, it was like the DNC and the RNC convergences were like these mass mobilizations that brought together a lot of like the revolutionary left to be together and kind of like learn the skills of bringing that number of people together. And um, so like Bashback kind of like was a part of that context. And I think that we've lost some of those skills over the years, like the skills of just being able to like handle a group of like, you know, 500,000 people that are like coming into a city, like housing, food, like, but the conflict management and like all those different things are aspects of it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just really fascinating history. Um, so next, I wanted to ask first Sheila T and then Max, if you could share a little bit about some tactics and strategies around uh, mutual aid, care, self-defense uh, that you're seeing on the ground uh, that you've uh, encountered or been a part of or, or seen and what you think works, what you think is helpful to people. Um, so Sheila T. Yeah, um, I feel like what I've been seeing for the last, I don't know, five to seven-ish years in Philly has been, in terms of mutual aid, a lot of um, information sharing and like um, distribution of like pepper spray and stuff like that in, ter in terms of like queers who are tied up in um, sex work stuff or just like bad date lists. Um, and yeah, just like information about which like, like how to get work done in ways that are like safer. And on the other hand, I feel like, yeah, people just kind of more informally networking with each other to kind of like have protection um, for work or not for work, um, just in life and like having like people that they know they can call and kind of like developing both that as like a, a social network or like set of social networks and also as like a set of skills to like de-escalate or escalate. Um, and I think a lot of that is not completely separate from, I guess I would say maybe like two things. And this is like partially tying back to some of the bashback stuff. Um, I feel like one is that at least here, it's like after a certain point, it just felt like the um, like anti-fascist organizing was just like queers were overly represented in that um, world. And so it, even though maybe from the outside or from like reading what people wrote, it didn't always, it wasn't always like super clear that it was like queer and trans um, people involved in like organizing against fascists and far right people. But I feel like that was a thing. And I feel like that also brought certain like skills and like ways of thinking to those networks that spilled beyond people who are just um, organizing against fascist stuff. Um, like one example I can think of from before COVID that like has kept going is that um, a lot of anti-fascists started practicing like different like boxing and like combat sports. Um, and then that kind of like spilled out and became like a, just like a larger than anti-fascist like anarchist thing. And then that spilled out larger and like was like open to like queers and anarchists and anti-fascists and kind of like their friends and networks as well. Um, and then on the other side, like kind of like less tied up with strictly anti-fascism and more tying up 
this kind of idea of like insurrectionary anarchy as it like was playing out with the bashback stuff i feel like there were a good amount of like yeah just like different attacks and sabotages that took place almost all of them were anonymous but some of them that had like responsibility claims or like any sort of like written communication were like written either like clearly influenced by queer theory and like queer ideas or like claimed by people um, who while like maintaining anonymity, like they did, they were like gay or trans or queer or dykes or whatever. And I feel like that, I imagine like network of people or groups of people like had to figure out the ways to like seek out and develop the like means to like do violence in the same way that the anti-fascists had to and i think that also that brought um a lot of like collective and individual empowerment to like those people in the networks that were around them as well thank you uh, and max yeah thanks for that question um and similar, right? Where it was like talk, like engaging in like mutual learning and information sharing. Um, what we're seeing working is like engaging in public facing events, you know. Um, this like allows for folks to find ways to plug in and new folks to support their affinity slash community building with. Um, oftentimes, you know, these folks are coming, their families are, you know, not as deep in the weeds and they don't, their friends, you know, they, they, I oftentimes speak with youth who are like, everybody around me isn't talking about this stuff. And so we have to create spaces for them to come and meet other youth or other people who are talking about this stuff. And for us, 2020 really opened up the door to, um, for the anti-fascist self, for anti-fascism, but also anti-fascist self-defense tactics. You know, Antifa got airwaves like never before. Um, and, you know, what is Antifa? Trended on Google searches for days, um, at, you know, during those times. So creating things like anarchist book fairs in the areas that don't you know normally have them sacramento we compete with the bay all the time you know um but here we have everything from like queer self-defense groups that are community uh, that are community forward facing that allow for community members to hit, up, hit us up and be like where are y'all training this weekend so i can join you they train every sunday um, we have for, we have a forward facing queer defense formation that walks our queer district in Sacramento. Um, we have events where queers can come and paint bricks. Um, in Sac, we have Pride was a riot, who's a who's dope, and um, is pink in a pink bandana, masked up and tabling at the farmers market on Saturdays. Um, even further, they did a campaign to get every vendor at that market to have signs that say we support trans kids. It's those forward facing public, it's those forward public facing efforts that are normalizing not just like anti fascism, but different tactics of self defense and all of its tactics, whether that's physically self defending and using things like pepper spray or self defense or physical self defense tactics or creating a culture in a community that pr that 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 provides that safety just by people walking in knowing that they're welcome. Um, things like that have proved the most helpful um, and have proved to support folks in their entering or in their introduction to anti-fascism and the anti-fascist orgs in town. Um, and it's allowed for us to meet folks where they're at with it too, you know? And we always talk about the different things that go into supporting this work. You know, we all see those flyers where there's like 10, uh, 10 support roles to a protest and things like that. You know, whether that's you're safely doing it from your home for all different kinds of able body types, right? We're being very inclusive in our ability in our in, in our ability to get involved but in how we're re we're meeting our community where they're at um and then during 2020 you know we held events um that did everything that from that we called them we keep us safe events and they talked about everything from tear gas and tourniquets to um to uh, abolition through an indigenous framework and gender 101 um, that went on like once a week throughout that time. And so this, this, this ability to create, again, public facing 
and we can't be afraid to be like we're anti-fascists you know like they got the they got the wit out on their table every saturday at the farmer's market you know they got it they got those big circles and those big a's everywhere oh you know it's normalizing it but by creating the, the ways for us to get publicly involved and to be meeting our community where they're at not only are we like normalizing these things but we're also letting them recognize that we're actually we're their community we are the community that they want to be a part of when they say they want housing as a human right when they say they want health care for all when they say they want food access for everybody that like this is actually an anarcho-communist um, thought and theory and they don't even recognize that they are objectively this way um, we need them to recognize it in their subjective lives as well um, so yeah that, that was that's about it for us is like that forward facing being willing to engage in in dialogue discussion information sharing and mutual learning oh that's beautiful um so i we're going to open it up between each other um and i have a question for everybody but it's also an opportunity to respond to each other and to begin to sort of draw out themes or things that are evocative for you and then at some point i'll start throwing in some questions from the audience on youtube so the question for everybody to open our discussion is what do you see as the value of self-defense in the current moment and Max uh, spoke to that in quite a number of ways just now. I guess I would say that self-defense is as important as ever um, and maybe like something to like pay particular attention to just because of the like ways that Korean trans people have been like more pointedly targeted, um, but I don't know, like in the sense that like self-defense is just literally essential for surviving that um, for me, it feels like, yeah, it could never not be an important thing. And I feel like specifically like as queer and trans people were like um, often like alienated and disempowered from like access to like violence and defense and that like now is as good of a time as any to like develop the means and skills and networks to like be able to take care of ourselves and each other. I think maybe I'll just add on. Um, it's so important right now because um, I spoke to it earlier about the devastation that we're seeing around us. Um, and that like on all fronts are we being attacked? Um, and and um, that's from everything from like state violence to far right extremist Christo fascism um, that has that extremism, religious extremism, because um, that is happening globally in different forms of religion um, and and even ecological devastation. You know what I mean? Like we are literally um, fighting for our lives and our survival. Um, and so, and so defending our joy, but like organizing our rage around how to defend ourselves from the very things that are trying to convince us and gaslight us about the very real devastation that's happening in our communities um, is absolutely the way forward because um, because then also when we, when because this is also like the, the peace in me, right? Um, it's like if we are all actually just moving from the form of like self-defense, then inevitably what we get to is that somebody one day is not throwing the first punch, you know? Um, and so to speak on it in such terms and such beauty, to talk about self-defense as like a, not a struggle for our lives, but the right for our lives um, is very important right now. Because like I said, our, our, our very existence is, is, is at stake. I think like for me, um, yeah, self-defense is su it's such a it's an interesting way to frame like violence because um, I think that we can all agree that it's a euphemism for violence. And um, a lot of times when, you know, when you kind of like, let's say there's a classic like instance of like a bigot that's confronting you um, or, or whatever, they're, like the escalation of that situation to violence is like a, it's a whole process and, um, you know, it's a complicated process. And so it's sort of like, for me, it's kind of like 
I guess, less about the act of violence and more about like, how are we like socially organizing ourselves around, um, you know, supporting ourselves in a revolutionary way and like having our kind of like eyes on the prize for the fact that like our, you know, like everyone is saying our system is killing us and, you know, especially like trans folks, like queer trans, especially trans women of color that are sex workers are like the front lines of this. And, you know, I don't even hear people like counting how many trans women are being murdered every year, but um, anymore, like, I feel like they did that around like 2014 and the like trans tipping point and it's not even happening, but I'm sure that it's like astronomical. And so I guess it's kind of like, for me, it's like that social aspect is really important. And that's sort of like where, like militancy comes in and not militancy. I think that like we have a tendency to kind of see militancy as like, oh, let's train ourselves in these different kind of like um, armed combat scenarios. And like, let's let's get trained up for um, using guns and let's get trained up in like martial arts and in, in a variety of different ways, which are of course important. But I think like there's another aspect to like military training that a lot of times I think we miss. And it's like a broader social kind of like experience of like, you know, and it's sort of like when people on the left say, oh, we're outgunned, we're outgunned in all of these different ways, which is true. We are like literally outgunned. Campaigns are not only, um, they're not only like, they're not only done through like arms, they're done through like a social kind of like organization of like of a army. So not only the logistics, but also the training kind of like strategies and how, how you bring people together to train them, how you feed them while they're going through this process, how you navigate like interpersonal conflict through all of those things. And so, you know, in thinking about like Bashback in particular, that's where I kind of like feel like these convergences were like just the tip of the iceberg for what could have been. Like, I, I really feel like Bashback was like an aborted movement. Like it, it was something that could have happened and it just, it just fell apart through the uh, whole variety of like things. But, you know, I think those convergences are like that kind of like component of like our, you know, the left is, is very skilled in these, in, these social dynamics far more skilled than the right and far and look at how much it takes for like the police and the army to maintain their social co cohesion and all of the money that goes into maintaining that whereas we have no money and we're still more socially powerful and so i think it's something that we need to remember about like you know violence and self-defense and kind of like you know revolutionary like our revolutionary potential I just want to add to what everyone has said, sort of the public facing side of, of self-defense and community defense, which I think Max articulated in a way I hadn't really thought of before, which is, you know, these are ways to bring people in. And they're also ways for people who like I they're the journalists who are following what's going on in these anti-fascist, like the anti-fascist accounts that are like documenting who these various extremist groups are, who the individuals are like they are doing the legwork so that we can do our job and help get that information out to even more people. I had people this summer asking me for the first time, um, do you think it's safe to go to Pride this year? Because they were hearing about all of these threats, um, he, including here in, in New York. And we had people come and, and harass a drag queen story hour in Queens a couple of weeks ago. So it's, you know, and when I thought of like, well, where do I send them to find out if it's safe? I was like, I think you should go to these anti-fascist Twitter accounts in New York, actually, like go see like what they are hearing, like what people feel safe sharing on Telegram, what they've seen on Telegram, like things like that, like getting that sort, it's another kind of normalization. Like this is a community resource that's here to be shared. Like, even if you might not be on the front line, like this is doing an incredible amount of community defense, even just on the level of information sharing. Um, and I think for groups who are dealing with these attacks for like the first time, um, they, you know, they're doing events that have never been targeted in this way. Just knowing that other people are doing it, that like other people are going through it, other people have strategies, that they're not alone in that um, is very important right now. Um, because I think some people are just like, it never would have occurred to them that like they would be attacked in this way, like in a community setting. Like I think, you know, there's a level of constant violence 
that we're still experiencing as queer and trans communities. But like people who are like, we were doing a story event at a library for children. Like, why are the Proud Boys showing up and trying to destroy that? So giving people just a sense that they are part of a community, even if they haven't experienced that yet, is is really important right now. Beautiful, beautiful responses. And I encourage people to elaborate or respond to each other as you see fit. Um, I'll ask a few questions that have come in from the audience. So uh, here's a practical legal one. Um, Jessica asks, as a formerly incarcerated trans woman in Washington state, my CCO tells me I'm not even allowed to possess pepper spray. After a record number of trans murders last year, I feel vulnerable. Is this even legal? I said that perhaps none of us would know. Uh, there are no lawyers in our group in terms of speaking to what's legal, but uh, I thought uh, with people distributing pepper spray, it might have come up at some point, sort of uh, to what extent that's that's restricted for for people on parole, probation, or. Um, and because I'm in California, I can't speak on Washington State, but I can speak to. I, well, first, I want to validate your very real, very real feelings. Um, and and uh, even if it is legal, that's the whole point, right? Fuck the state. Um, they're trying to make sure we are out here being killed. Um, but what I can tell you is like, but and there wasn't enough in there for me to kind of like deduce this down for you, but like depending on if it's probation or parole, you can actually find that information um, uh, if you look at the terms of parole in your state or terms of probation in your state. Most of the time that's actually not like bear mace and things like that are, are big things um, in the areas, but like little pepper spray, no, it's usually not. But like I said, I would I would definitely look into the probation um, codes and the parole codes, just depending on what you on what you fall within for Washington. Great. OK, uh, Lane asks, can you all speak to the effectiveness of having bash back blocks or large specific affinity groups and organized actions like some of the pros and cons of that model? Um, well, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, we're at the point where, um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I kind of like thought that I don't, I don't know. I kind of thought that we were going to move beyond uh black bloc by this point in the anti-fascist development. I hate to say it, but like, I just find it to be a very like, uh, reductive tactic. I, I kind of like felt like we would get to a point where we're like doing more fluid anonymity um, or what some folks call gray block. And um, but 2020 kind of like I, I just was like, oh, wow, it's really back and it's really back in full force. And um, and I think there's pros and cons to it. A lot of the actions, the bashback actions got the um, Definitely, like people were uh, the got the attention of law enforcement, and the FBI was tracking people, and all, all of that kind of stuff that that's happening with Antifa right now. And um, you know, post 2020, I feel like I just a lot of people like were, you know, a lot of people blocked up for for actions and um, kind of like. I don't know, it's just very easy. It's not easy, but it's like law enforcement can track the people's block like fairly regularly. And, um, you know, and, and so it's very difficult to kind of like, you know, wear black block and stay safe in the street, like in terms of like you're, you know, staying anonymous. So I don't know, I just think that like, we just need a more like, just a more, like robust discussion on like how we're maintaining that anonymity and how we're blocking up and how we're kind of like appearing and disappearing for these kind of like actions. And, you know, I think that like, we're just, I just think that there's like some things that could 
that we could move forward in that regard. So as far as like bash back actions go, I don't really feel like there was like a lot of development in terms of like black block or like street kind of like anonymity or things like that. But um, but yeah, so hopefully uh, hopefully we can move move the discussion now, but always be safe on the street. Like I'm not saying like don't go like don't go unblocked ever. Um, and there's all these, you know, safety tactics. So just my two cents. I, yeah, I do feel like we could definitely have a lot or like as people who are excited to see things in the street get weirder, um, there's a lot we can do better at in terms of like developing anonymity. Um, but then as I kind of want to go back to the question in terms of like, is it useful to have a bash back block, not necessarily as a block of people who all dress the same, but maybe as like a block of people with similar intentions or like a way to kind of like make an intention have like a specific geographic place. And I think that that still feels very useful. And that oftentimes people will come to demonstrations and feel very alone and like have a specific kind of intention or like a person that they would, a kind of person that they'd rather be around and whether that person is dressed alike or not with them is maybe like to me feels less relevant than maybe like there are other ways to call for a block being like we want like a queer anti-capitalist block at this like may 1st demonstration or like this anti-fascist demonstration is calling for like um like a militant trans feminine block or like something like that and that can look as simple as being like this block of people like maybe like four people are going to like like um dedicate to like bringing like a banner that says like queers bash back or like having a pink and um black flags just so that they can be found by other people who would like maybe be interested in like walking with them whether it's to like get into a fight or just be around other queers or whatever but like calling for a block in the sense of like people walking in a block or like being together in a block still feels very useful although definitely we should always be stepping our game up in terms of security i think i'll build off of that too of like what like already just like these, um, by having them exist in the first place, whether they get called or not, what it is is like creating like safe queer spaces um, for organizing um, anti-fascist tactics and building affinity and community. Um, but like having them in in places and present, it like it does flag for folks that it exists in our area and um, and when when folks go out together, how they could possibly find or or know that it you know know that it just exists um i think like showing up presently in those ways make sure that like queer and trans militancy is like a part of the discussion and a part of actions like towards liberation but like i am i but to like segue into this like idea of gray block and into these ideas of like more more um subtle anonymity um like we just actually use that tactic here in california um, we, uh, every year have a straight pride held in Modesto, um, and over the last four years have tried to build up a community response to successfully shut that platform down. Um, this year was one of the best years that we've ever done it. Um, and, and we did that by calling for a 9 a.m. gray block, um, that was well-coordinated, well-organized, and, you know, many affinity groups up and down were talking. Um, to be able to pull out those numbers and coordinate showing up on time together. But next thing you know, there's like a couple, there's a over a hundred gray block, radical trans queer, uh, radical trans queer um, anti-fascists hanging out, ready to like shut down a straight pride event. Um, that was then, you know, and then we had even like an 11 a.m. regular community call too, where just like regular community members got a flyer at 11 a.m. to come and show up to this event and like really hold it down with us. Um, and so, um, and then to mention like the 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 the, the gray block that like Pride, Pride was a riot and the Lavender Angels in Sacramento go out and do when they're doing their queer self-defense formation um, that, that definitely allow for folks to like be able to point them out, tell that they're them um, and be able to like check in and count on them but it like it just really depends i think on on like what what the block is for and like um 
and what exactly the organized action is, right? Is it like patrolling your queer district? Is it is it shutting down straight pride? Is it um, showing up in the name of Black Lives? Like what what is it? Um, and that that can kind of help. But I always think I love to see. It. I love it. I love it every time. Uh, there are a couple of questions about disability inclusion. Um, Morgan uh, asked about, talked about the intense isolation of many queer disabled people around the world um, since the pandemic. And Tovia asked about how queer and trans self-defense can be more accessible to disabled and poor people. Um, so I think from everyone, sort of what you see as uh, strategies around disability inclusion and what that looks like and what that can mean. I mean, as far as um, disability and and kind of accessibility issues go, I, I just feel like I go back to um, the concept of like a military formation and the social aspect of it and the understanding that um, there are so many different roles within actions that everybody can take part in and creatively engage in and like, and also like, in terms of like determining targets and in terms of like the kind of like so like social media constellations that these actions happen in um that you know all of these things are like a part of like a you know kind of a campaign like a military campaign or something like that and so i i just think that um we're like our our imagination is sort of like we're we're kind of like hitting a brick we keep hitting a brick wall in terms of like um, you know, just kind of like confronting these these instances on the street when we see them and not sort of like the the broader like ways that we can be like training and preparing ourselves in in like a broader sense, like in, in terms of thinking of like, you know, like how what what do we want to create? How do like trainings work? How do these like all of these different things involve like they don't involve just like, you know, uh, just two people like fighting or like a group of people fighting. They involve so many different kind of like people and components to it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, even just like I, I was feeling like in 2020, like so many different actions would happen. And, and it's sort of like, um, you know, the, the affinity groups that I saw forming would tend to focus around, um, you know, kind of like being the like the most like vulgar form of like frontliners. So like holding a, a line of shields for like uh, against cops or fascists or whatever. But um, a lot of times like those actions would forget all of the different components of making a successful march or action happening, happen such as like scouts, such as like um, evacuating people, such as medics, such as like, even social media communication, like all of these different like components of it kind of like tend to fall by the wayside because we prioritize the, the like, um, just th this sort of like, you know, the, the one very vis visible clash. And I think we just need to like change our imagination. Um, Morgan, I really thank you for your question. And I think I'm gonna uh, speak on um, a conversation I actually just had with somebody who, um, so I'm a part of an abolitionist organization, very, very public, forward facing in, in the area, um, who reached out and uh, had said that they were worried about showing up to our events um, because, they, because of COVID, um, because wondering about our pandemic safety precautions um is what they were asking about and 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 through this conversation they got to kind of really inform me about how isolated they felt and how neglected um the uh, they felt by folks um acting like the pandemic was over um and and so what we were able to do through that was like promise that our events um indoor outdoor all of that were going to of course um continue to to um, make sure that we were following uh, COVID safety precautions. Um, but I think as a movement, um, it is actually on us as to, to realize that um, 
we are creating a space that is not safe for our um, for other able-bodied types and other folks in our community um, who don't feel safe, who don't even feel like they could walk up to us and tell us this because we're walking around with our masks off. Um, and 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 I know that there's many leftists in my area. You know, there's many community events right now in my community that are actively not in, not um, encouraging masks, um, and and therefore not creating a culture where we're doing that. Um, and so it is kind of like the work that we're doing here. Um, uh, I at the time I was I remember having the conversation. And I was like, I, you know, I don't know really what to do about everybody else. Um, but the truth is, is being like a, a, a grassroots organizer in town, I've been doing it for so many years that I do know a lot of folks. And so actually it is on me to call my friends and be like, hey, can you make sure that there's masks at your events? You know, like, can we make sure that we're creating a space that includes our, um, our all of our brothers, sisters and non-binary folks? Like, like, are we making sure that we're doing this? Because um, because I don't even think that we know, right? It's like this privilege that we get. And like, you know, it, and, and had that person not come into my inbox and been like, hey, I want to be able to come to your events. You're one of the only dopest abolitionist orgs in town. And I don't know if I can because I don't know what your policies and stuff are on wearing masks at the events. Um, it was without that conversation, I wouldn't have even been able to, been, to even see that they had been so isolated from this community for years. You know, like people, the world is acting like it's going back to normal. And we have to, we have to, tell the world that it's not. We are living in an endemic. Um, and 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 so because of it, we have to create spaces that are still acting like COVID is a very real thing. And I thank you for your question. Um, and I'm hoping the organizers across this country and that people that are watching are gonna tell their friends, hey, the next event we throw, masks, yo. Um, and I do encourage you, Morgan, to reach out to some organizations with that question asking how can you participate in your area? Because that was how I was, that was how we were able to do it, you know? Um, and and I know that puts a lot of the work on you and that's not fair, um, but we start somewhere. Um, and because that one person tapped us, we're able to like have a, the ripple effects are, 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 are going beyond. For me, I think, and like, like a more zoomed in kind of like smaller scale way, a lot of the inclusion and ability stuff came down to like small group conversations about what kinds of risks people felt okay with, what kind of like, yeah, like, which kind of, because the thing is like, there's a jillion different roles. There's not like one right way to like do defense or offense or whatever. And like, yeah, kind of coming from, like, a smaller affinity group place, like, having, like, a less macho attitude and, like, having less failures of imagination and, like, more space for, like, creativity in terms of, like, how to move forward is, like, for me, has always felt like an easier way to, like, break out of, like, a certain kind of, like, really rigid, like, frozen idea of, like, what a militant is. And, um, yeah, like, having dialogue around that like, in, like, in a small group being like able to take into consideration as many needs as possible and like how that feels like dignified or not for everyone and how that feels like worthwhile in terms of like getting this or that kind of thing done has been like um, one way that I've seen that addressed around me. There's another question that came in um, uh, about socialist rifle clubs and John Brown gun clubs. So those have been getting a lot of news and what you see is the sort of relationship between the kind of different left gun club worlds and how they intersect uh, or diverge in movements. Absolutely, at least here. Um, and then they're helping arm and train our queer and trans folks, as well as just members of this community. Um, I think Sacramento's maybe, uh, we're like a kind of a small town with a big city vibe. Um, and so that's how we're able to like work kind of closely together. Um, but I think that intentional outreach and, and working with those folks is important because um, not only is it like providing that uh, community building and affinity building, but like I said, because of it, we were able to be, we were able to hook up our Socialist Rifleist Association, our, um, uh, with our local queer and trans community to help them get their CCWs, to help train them on how to use the, their weapons, um, to also uh, take them up and uh, they, they go up shooting once a month and to train them how to do that. 
Uh, so it's been pretty, it's been pretty effective. Any thoughts about the presence of firearms um, by leftists at, at protests over the last year? What's your assessment of its effectiveness, its impact, its uh, the pros and cons of it? I, I mean, can't speak. Well, let's say, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, my bad. Um, you should go ahead. Okay, everyone went quiet. How about Sheila T? How about you go first? Um, sure, sorry. Um, in Philly, there hasn't been any sort of like big visible presence of firearms at demonstrations. And I don't think that that means that there aren't any there. I think it means that oftentimes if like anarchists, anti-fascists or leftists are carrying firearms or not making any kind of like noise about it and they're not like trying to like show them or like use them as like I mean like they are a deterrent but I don't think that they're a deterrent in terms of like their visibility and how people use them here and that's been interesting to not see I guess and um the same has been the case during a lot of like the 2020 riding I think like a lot of people were carrying maybe more than showed up and like it just never the firearm just never came out like it and I think maybe that also has to do with like how clashes get policed here um and like that I don't know that there's just maybe also just like already a lot of guns in Philadelphia in general but um I think it's like hard to weigh in on like whether that's effective or not or what I think maybe like in terms of the individual's carrying and like the people around them that know that if there's like something empowering or useful or relevant but in terms of like materially how it's played out between different like teams clashing it's like super invisible and i don't even know if people are assuming it one way or the other and or like how much that plays out in terms of people's assumptions about clashes as they take place Abby, do you want to go? Um, yeah, I feel like that's a similar story in Los Angeles too. I just, um, I guess I would just say like, I think that, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just think that like uh, the escalation should be on par with like, um, with what's happening. And I think that, you know, I, I don't think that we're at a point with like gun battles or anything like that. Um, and so I think that it's good to train for whatever and, and everything, but I think like, you know, I don't know. I personally kind of like look back at the weather underground and feel like it was sort of in like, oh, like biting off more than they could chew and an over escalation given the, given the context, um, so, and I kind of feel like, I don't really think that people are doing that. Um, I feel like people are, are generally like within the, the realm of like what's, what's happening and like the messaging and like kind of like what's going on. So, so I kind of feel like, you know, I, I don't know how long, like how, how long does it take to train somebody on how to use a firearm? Like, I mean, a boot, a military boot camp is like what, like six weeks or eight weeks or something like just kind of like a rudimentary one. So I'm kind of like, if things came, push come to shove, I feel like people could get trained up really fast. That's just my personal opinion, but um, I, I'm glad that people are learning. I too am glad that people are learning um, because I think specifically where we saw most of the, um, most of the, uh, most of the guns were on the far right. <laughs> like that was where most of the guns lived during 2020. 
Um, in our area, we had uh, far right extremists who were able to walk around with their CCWs, their concealed weapons permits, and have their guns in their holster. Um, uh, being able to walk right by law enforcement while giving each other hugs and high fives, um, you know, and 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 the truth is, is that um, but this is where we're at, right? Like they're bringing guns, so then therefore we feel like we and this are all antagonisms and all dialectical and and all how it goes, but eventually it does though, it does get to that um, gun battle. Um, we we have already lost lives in 2020 due to far right. Um, guns um and then you know and then any self-defense tactics then they were taken out by the state you know we saw what happened to the individual up in washington uh and um and so do we see a role with guns i i and, and where are they at i mean they're out there um and we have to decide how we want to engage in that um and we have to decide and that's really where it is is right like when we talk about defending our joy and organizing our rage us as communities have to have those conversations with ourselves being like we know that this is coming we know that this exists what how do we want to do this how do we want to engage in this um and 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 best prepare in the way that we can but the truth is is we're training folks up because that's what we're up against we are up against death whether that's state violence, um, far right extremist violence, or climate catastrophe, it, which you know it all leads to our death, and we absolutely have to be willing to defend ourselves. Um, but again, like it gets there, we have to name that. We have to be willing to name that as a movement. We have to say that out loud. It's going to get to gun battles, and do we want to get to gun battles? I don't think we do. That's not really what we're. That's not our. That's not really our. Really our goal when we say housing is a human right, food for all, education for everybody. But we're not trying to do that at gunpoint, you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's just all I have to say. Is like we have to name it. We have to name that. It's 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 a time. It's a matter of time. We've already. It's it's not even like decades off. It's like years off, um, and we're here now. So. I just wanted to add something quick on Texas, um, speaking of where the guns are, and also a state where you barely need anything to carry a gun, I think, at this point, with constitutional carry. Um, and I certainly of all of the sort of events over the summer and into the fall that I've been following, it seems like the Elm Fork John Brown Club is super present at many of the these like counter protests or demos to sort of physically block the far right groups from either messing with people in the community, whether that's like, you know, escorting people to their car or standing in front of um, a venue to, you know, kind of be a physical block, whether or not they're even caring, like they're like very much there like as a group. And so I'm wondering, Alvi, if that's sort of connected to some of the things you were talking about in terms of like group cohesion, like is there a role to play for these groups um, in sort of having those like cohesive groups who are kind of like ready to roll? And in the case of Texas, you know, there are definitely guns present on um, the side of the far right openly. So it might be a different dynamic. Um, and certainly like it hasn't come to the point yet where people are actually like engaged in in gun battles, but I think there it's sort of, it's it's not expected. Like I think like I've seen some very strange responses from the far right to like the um, Fort John Brown Club in particular and just sort of like weird macho posturing about guns sort of in response to like oh antifa they can't they can't um be macho enough to carry guns just it's just it seems like on a certain level it messes with them um but on another level like people in community are seeing that like there is somebody here who is like armed who will walk them to their car or prevent somebody from entering a venue um who might harm them Did you have something you wanted to add, LB? Oh, I, I just still think that n like numbers are our biggest strength. And I, I just feel like uh, when I think about conflict mediation, and I'm not talking about de-escalating or street conflicts or anything like that, I'm like just talking about conflict mediation among our comrades. Like I feel like the more that I work on that, the more that I realize how much like effort and skills and just kind of like like training goes into just getting along with our comrades and so it's like you have uh like you'll have a conflict between two different comrades but it really is a conflict between like their friends and like 
other friends and like it's a whole constellation of that so even just like checking in with everybody about what's going on with that conflict is like um hours and hours of emotional labor not to mention like thinking through like uh responses to someone's trauma responses to um you know how, how to help somebody through all of the different kind of like therapeutic or just like logistical um forces that put somebody in a place where they can't resolve a conflict with their comrade or like and i'm not even talking about like inner part like interpersonal violence like sexual assault and things like that which is like even more complicated it takes even more resources and so like when i spend time in the communities i spend time in it's sort of like uh you know radical communities it's like we don't have any resources around that. Like it's very like taxing. These things are taxing. So when I think about like um, training around guns or something, I feel like, um, yeah, it's totally great and we should all do that. However, there's like, we have a gaping wound in like, we have just this gaping wound in our communities that we don't, that we have not like resolved. We have not, we don't have the resources around, we have not, organize the resources around solving those kind of things. And I feel like to me, that's like every project that we start, like it gets destroyed by interpersonal conflict. And it's just time and time again. And it's like, when are we gonna learn the lesson that is sort of like when, you know, for example, we've gotten really good on, you know, in the revolutionary left around like feeding mass groups of people, 500 people or whatever, and it's, like we know that all of the logistics that it takes to like get the food, cook the food, like have the recipes, serve the food, like all of these different aspects. And yet when it comes to interpersonal conflict, we don't approach it with that kind of rigor. And that's where I kind of feel like, you know, our, our real effort should, that's where I'm talking about like the kind of like socializing of like a military response. Sort of like those are the, that's, that's the kind of like social dimension that I think that we like that is, is really important to to take seriously when we're talking about like queer like violence queer self-defense and like all of those things over the last uh 10 minutes that we have i want to focus us in on uh what we see as the potential for new formations and strategies uh people have spoken to this in various ways lv you talked about bash back being an aborted attempt and our uh, project and uh, some of the conflict mediation stuff you're thinking about. Max, you referred a little bit, gestured to a future horizon and the kinds of formations that might be appropriate. Um, I know you have a little bit to say about this, Melissa. So let's, let's close out in doing a go around and us all speaking to this. I can start. I don't have a ton to say because I feel like everyone's covered a lot of what it takes to build these formations. And I like that was exactly kind of what I wanted to hear. I like the sense that like before you're like taking up arms, like what are you doing actually to like strengthen the group? What are you doing to sort of build those resources that people have? Like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to go to that level of escalation if the group actually isn't connected and isn't caring for one another in a way and doesn't have those resources. It's I, I've been going back and forth, like in what I'm seeing, like part of me feels like we're in a moment where it's like all hands on deck, lots of strategies are in play, lots of different people are like tangling with this question right now, like how do you respond when the far right shows up? Um, and there's so much, you know, institutional knowledge among anti-fascists on how to do that. What I've been seeing over the last couple of months, like for example, in, in Idaho, um, this was where the Patriot Front showed up in the U-Haul and were arrested, 31 of them, before the Pride event. But it ended up almost, for the people there, like they had a whole other plan that was actually what they were focused on that day in terms of creating a safe space for folks having big banners to block um, people who were trying to like record people, things like that. Um, but it was an interesting moment to watch sort of like, you know, the 501c3 universe of, of queer and trans life 
negotiate how do you work with anti-fascist activists and like what are we comfortable with groups who are mostly just going to call the cops to report things realizing that that is not a safe strategy and i think particularly after 2020 has attuned people to you know looking for safety outside of policing um so i'm i'm it's hard to say i'm optimistic about anything but like i i'm seeing those as like very productive tensions of people sort of like working out like what tools do we have to respond that aren't law enforcement what capacities do we have for people who maybe aren't politically aligned with us but like are the ones who are showing up and getting it done um like you were saying in the beginning um the kind of like liberals who are just like had never considered you know anything like direct action or self-defense seeing like what the need is in their community and seeing who's showing up um and you know if that's like folks at the farmers market, which I love as a, as an entry point, or people just like all of a sudden following a zillion anti-fascist researchers on Twitter, which other folks are doing, like there's I think this is a, a potentially community building moment on that side. I think for me, what feels most exciting about new formations isn't like any specific kind of like model and or like style of organizing. I think like that people are getting excited to try to get things done at all is more exciting to me. Like I don't care if someone starts a gang or an affinity group or like a syndicate or whatever, like any, like so all these like specific formation styles are so contextual and I don't think that there's like a right one for any one context necessarily, but like thinking through that like people are thinking through that they want to do specific thing they want to get together with other people to get it done and like how can they do that feels maybe like the most exciting to me or like the one that I feel like is going to be as flexible as it needs to be anyway and like um that I look forward to the most Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of like feel like I sort of outlined some of the things that I, I feel about like um, what would be great to see in the next year or few years. Um, I think also in addition to kind of like this social sort of like understanding of like the component of, of violence, I also just think like loudly pro proclaiming that like violence is a part of our revolutionary like um, imagination and like yes self-defense but also like violence does happen it is part of like consequences to navigating conflict and um and i think that like not shying away from that is important and i also think that um really like especially for folks that are kind of like seeking out a conversation along this are are probably um folks that are more drawn to building that kind of like social capacity. So I would just encourage all of us to like seek out those folks that have already kind of like committed these acts of like self self defense, queer violence, like other things like that and are getting caught up in different kind of like charges or being doxxed by fascists or other things like that. And really think about how we can very, very materially support them um in in uh, different capacities because i also think like that was one of the things that bashback was really important for was was when people take those actions we're there to have their back and you know unconditionally almost um and so you know there, were, there was a, a number of targets that i remember having conversations with people about in the late 2000s where people were like oh that wasn't the target i would have chosen i don't think that we should support x y or z but like really like i just think that you know we need to to be there for each other um and like people get caught up and the fascists are going to find the most vulnerable among us and take them down and you use them as examples for the rest of us and we need to push back against that at every opportunity max do you want to close us out and saying what we should do for the future yeah i mean and I think y'all kind of, everybody kind of touched on it. And that's, but the truth is, is I'm like most excited because that's what we are in. 
y'all, we are in this like programmatic, pragmatic stage of like, what do we do um, as like a, a, a as a people, not even just like as a movement, but like as a people, right? As like, as again, we we try to talk about understanding the devastation around us and we are trying to come up with figuring that out. Um, and the, I think like LV, you tapped it right on the head. The most important thing that we need to begin to do is address the gaping wound. I mean, like what we've seen over and over again. And I think what, didn't, didn't uh, the FBI do a whole report on the Twitter war and the shit talking that people were doing? in um in uh in seattle uh, like they were like just wanted watching our twitter beefs online um and stuff like that about like what do we do um in 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 the inevitability of conflict you know what i mean it is it is not something that we could ever avoid like literally that's where evolution comes from you need conflict on even down to a cellular level in order for change to occur um and how we actually embrace that stuff um, instead of using, instead of it being something that like devastates, um, is something that we absolutely have to get better at. Um, it, when we talk about another world as possible, when we talk about what a, what a, what a vision looks like and what the world can be, um, it looks like us being able to like actively speaking my boundaries and you affirm and, or I'm sorry, affirmatively speaking my boundaries and people actively listening to them and back and forth. But until we can begin to like mediate the harm that we're causing as we're unlearning all this toxic shit, um, and we're enacting all of these toxic things on each other as we're trying to build towards liberation, then all we're going to do is have to start over again every single time. Um, and it's going to, and it's going to weaken our movement every single time. Um, and something else I do, I just want to pop into these questions that I saw real quick. And somebody spoke about like, what else we'll do uh, around um, the existing culture and structures because of concerns of anonymity. Somebody was like, hey, sometimes it prevents folks from getting involved. Something that I would love for us to do um, in the future is to make ourselves more accessible um, to, to our community, make our thought processes more accessible to our community. And then for us to name out loud that it takes time to trust build, it takes time to relationship build, it takes time to community build, and so your your automatic want to hop into an organization where they're like, oh, we don't know you, has to be taken kindly. But also this organization needs to be like, how are we making this successful? How are we making a space to trust build with this person, with this community, and vice versa? Um, which then will lead us to having conversations about how do we address the gaping wound that is that we don't know how to navigate conflict in our own movement, you know? Um, and so those are the, really the two things that I really absolutely feel um, are the biggest uh, and are in the directions we're going. Even the fact that every single panelist on this call today talked about it means that y'all who are watching this today are probably thinking about it. And therefore there are many, many, many people in this movement having this conversation amongst themselves. You can give thanks for that. I give thanks for that, that we are trying to figure it out. Um, but like, I think that that's where our focus should be. Gaping holes and addressing our, um, and how we allow for community members who are brand new to this to come in and learn and, and not allow for our fear of being like sacrificed to the cops, you know, um, keep us from allow from teaching people what the fuck security culture is. Beautifully said. Well, uh, just a magnificent discussion tonight. You all, you are, are such brilliant people and I hope I get to call you all as comrades um, in the years ahead. So well done. Thank you, everybody. Um, and let's close it out. And uh, are we done with re recording, Sean?